know, while we're doing this, um, why are we doing it? What's the point of it all? Must be some purpose to it. just uh, finally have to come to the issue sooner or later what's so philosophical about this as interesting as it might be or like, why raise the issue I mean, why is a curious issue do false pleasures exist and what is the circumstance of their coming into existence and then he wants to compare and weigh the way in which they're coming into existence, under what circumstances they come into existence, but then they can come into existence in three ways, greater, smaller, with various degrees of intensity. So, you know, when you compare pleasure against pleasure, pain against pain, right? he's weighing them. But those three elements, he's looking at a mixed class. Just to get into 41, he's got one line that interests me. But then, of the evil pleasures, which are such because of evil, we will speak a little later if we still care to do so. But of the false pleasures, we must prove in another way that they exist and come into existence in us often and in great numbers. This may help us reach our decisions. Yeah, yeah, of course. That is, if such pleasures exist. Because Petrarchus wants to say, of course, there are no such thing as a false pleasure. You can't have a false pleasure. A pleasure is a pleasure. How foolish to consider that there can be a false pleasure. Therefore, Petrarchus is saying, hey, you know what? You can go ahead, go, you can go ahead and try to do this, but in principle, you know what? I don't think it's possible to have a false pleasure. A pleasure is a pleasure. Socrates. But they do exist, Petrarchus, in my opinion. However, until we've established the truth of this opinion, it cannot be on question. My liquor, so this is rather curious. Uh, um, it's going to establish the truth of this. Look here. We're going to get to this is what where we're going is the way in which he thinks you establish truth. <clears throat> so what? Hey, you know what? This way of establishing the truth of this kind of a problem may be just what he needs when he talks about pure, not mixed, but pure pleasure, etc. Look here. We want to know what? He's going to offer a way to establish the truth of this? What? That false pleasures exist, both in number and kind and degree, etc.? Petrarchus says you can't do it. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll establish the truth. This way of establishing the truth, once we get it, we can now use it for other purposes. 
If you can see it here, he's going to use it. So let's see how this tricky dude does it. Then let us, like athletes, approach and grapple with this new argument. Okay, recollection, feelings. Now, um, he's going to go back over it. Watch circumstances, sensations, these two terms, circumstances and sensations, right? We said, you may remember, a little while ago, that when desires, as they are called, exist in us, the body is apart from and separate from the soul in that it has feelings. Right. And it's interesting, you see? Uh, right. See? The soul is that which desired the opposite. Mm -hmm. So the desire has desire, right? Has desires. Opposite the body. <clears throat> body has feelings. Ah. central to what he's doing. <clears throat> he's going to remember. Ah, I remember. And was not the soul that which desired the opposites of the condition of the body and the body that which caused pleasure or pain because of feeling? Right? Because of feeling? Uh, thirst. Empty. That's the condition of the body. Agree? That's the condition of the body. Yes. He says, you know what? The soul remembers how to alleviate that. But this is the condition of the body. Therefore, the soul desires the opposite of the condition of the body. That is, that the body has feelings, in this case, of being empty. And the body has desires opposite because it remembers the condition that satisfies the emptiness. If it weren't for that, the emptiness would continue. And was not the soul that which desired the opposite of the condition of the body, and the body that which uh, caused pleasure or pain because of the feeling? Because it feels empty, pain, and when it's then satisfied, it sees pleasure. That's the condition of the body. As a consequence of the soul's interaction with the body. It informs the body, informs us what to do. Then draw the conclusions as to what takes place in these circumstances. Go on. What takes place is this. In these circumstances, pleasure and pains exist at the same time. And the sensations, the opposite pleasures and pains are present side by side simultaneously, as was made clear just now. Agree? At this time, Right. What takes place is that this, in this circumstance, pleasures and pains exist. Right? Because he feels the pain of being empty, and he can recall what it's like to experience the satisfaction of that, and therefore that recollection of it can give him a sense of pleasure and a sense of expectation, doesn't it? 
So simultaneously, that person could have two experiences at the same time. Simultaneously. And have we not? And have we not also said and agreed and settled something further? Huh? What? That both pleasure and pain admit of the more and less. They're in the class of the infinite. Oh. More and less. Then what means is there to judge rightly of this? Uh, what do you mean? I mean to ask whether the purpose of our judgment in these matters in such circumstances is to recognize that in each instant which of the elements is greater or smaller or more intense? Right. Which of these elements is greater or smaller or more intense comparing pain with pleasure, pain with pain, pleasure with pleasure? Right. Yeah. These are our contrasts. It's a purpose for our judgment. In such circumstances, right, I need to ask whether the purpose of our judgment of, of these matters in which circumstances to recognize in each instance which of the elements is greater, smaller, blah, 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 blah. That's the purpose. Oh, okay. What for? Ah, well, there are differences. That's the purpose of the judgment. Well, then, in the case of sight. All right, now, look here. What's he giving us? Establishing the truth. All right? So he's going to do it by examples. Well then, in the, in the case of sight, seeing things from too near at hand or from too great a distance obscures their real sizes and causes us to have false opinions. And doesn't uh, the same thing happen in the case of pains and pleasures? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then. Okay. In the realm of opinion, based upon the data of the senses, he's saying it's similar to the same thing in terms of pleasure and pains. It is inevitable, inevitable, the reasons you're given. They both then appear greater or less than the reality. Now, if you abstract from both of them this apparent but unreal excess or inferiority, uh, you cannot say that its appearance is true, nor again can you have the face to affirm that the part of the pleasure and pain which corresponds to this is true or true. Or real? No, I can't. Next, then, we have to see whether we may not, in another direction, come upon pleasures and pains still more false than these appearing existing in living beings. Oh, we can come upon pleasures and pain, pain still more false. Oh, oh. Oh, the pleasures and pains, and some are even more false. New class. Ooh, that's curious. That's where we're going. Next, then, we will see whether we may not, in another direction, come upon pleasures and pains still more false than these appearing and existing in living beings. What pleasures? Uh, what method? 
Hey, it's been said many times that pains and woes and aches and everything that's called by the names of that sort of cause, when nature in any instance is corrupted through combinations, dissolutions, fillings, emptings, increases, and diminution, right? That's what brings about uh, pains and woes, right? It's been said many times. Yeah, yeah, we agree that when things are restored to their natural condition, the restoration is pleasure. Yeah. But when neither of these changes take place in the body, what then? What could be the case? See? Filling is pleasure, right? If emptying, if emptying is pain, well, what happens when there is neither? When neither of these changes take place in the body, what then? Then what could be the case, Socrates? Ah, your question is not to the point. Why not? Because you did not prevent my asking my own question again. What question? Why, Protarchus? Here we are. I may say, granting that such a condition does arise, what would be the necessary result if it did? You mean if the body's not changed in either direction? Right. See? Neither. Here we are. Neither empty, not neither filling it, nor emptying it. Well, it doesn't neither pleasure or pain. Excellent. But you believe, I fancy, that uh, some such change must always be taking place in us, as philosophers say. For all things are always flowing and shifting. Yeah, that's what they say. Of course it is, in view of their own importance. But I, but I should like to avoid this argument which is rushing at us. I'm not. I'm going to run away. Come along and escape with me. What's your way of escape? Okay. Here's his statement. Uh, we do not agree that everything is flowing and going on, but how much are you aware of? We grant you all this. Let us say to them, but answer me this, Petrarchus. Are we and all our loving beings always conscious of everything that happens to us, to our growth and all that sort of thing? Or is the truth the opposite? Quite the, quite the reverse. Quite the reverse. Then we're right in saying just now that the fluctuation and changes cause pain and pleasure. No. Better. A more reasonable statement would be this. What? That the great changes causes pain and pleasure, said us, but the moderate and small cause none. Right? Only great changes, not mere changes. Right? And he calls them ah, good, good. It's more correct, but if that is the case, the life of which we spoke just now would come back again. What life? A life which we said was painless and without joys. Let us therefore assume three lives, pleasant, painful, neither. All right, so now we got three lives. Freedom from pain would not be identi identical with pleasure, certainly not. Why not? When, when you, you hear, hear anyone, anyone say, say that the pleasant of all things is to live out all one's life without pain, how do you understand that? I think he means that freedom from pain is pleasure. Now let's assume that we have these three things. 
no matter what they are. Let's use fine names you call one, gold, silver, and mixed. Got that? Let's get a couple of readers in play. Who's in? Well, I'll read. Okay, two of you? Okay. And can that which is neither become either silver or gold? Either gold or silver? Certainly not. Neither can that middle life of which we spoke ever be rightly considered an opinion or called in speech pleasant or painful or at any rate by those who reason correctly? No, certainly not. But surely, my friend, we are aware of persons who call it and consider it so. Hmm, certainly. Do they then think that they feel pleasure when, whenever they are not in pain? That's what they say. Then they do think that they feel pleasure at such times, for otherwise they would not say so. Hmm, most likely. Certainly then they have a false opinion about pleasure, if there is an essential difference between feeling pleasure and not feeling pain. And we certainly found that difference. And shall we adopt the view that there are, as we said just now, three states, or that there are only two? Pain, which is an evil to mankind, and freedom from pain, which is of itself a good and is called pleasure. Why do we ask ourselves that question now, Socrates? I do not understand. No, Protarchus, for you certainly do not understand about the enemies of our friend Philetus. Whom do you mean? Certain men who are said to be master thinkers about nature and who deny the existence of pleasures altogether. Is it possible? They say that what Philetus and his school call pleasures are all merely ref refuges from pain. Refuge. Refuges. <coughs> from pain. Do you recommend that we adopt their views, Socrates? No, but that we make use of them as seers who divine the truth, not by acquired skill, by some innate, not ignoble, repugnance, which makes them hate the power of pleasure and think it so utterly unsound that its very attractiveness is mere trickery, not pleasure. You may make use of them in this way, considering also their other expressions of dislike. And after that, you shall learn of the pleasures which seem to me to be true, in order that we may consider the power of pleasure from both points of view and form our judgment by comparing them. You are right. Let us then consider these men as allies and follow them in the track of their dislike. I fancy their method would be to begin somewhere further back and ask whether, if we wish to discover the nature of any class, take the hard, for example, for instance, we should be more likely to learn it by looking at the hardest things, or at the least hard. Now you, Protarchus, must reply to them as you have been replying to me. By all means, and I say to them that we should look at the greatest things. Then if we wish to discover what the nature of pleasure is, we should look not at the smallest pleasures, but at those which are considered most extreme and intense. Everyone would agree to that now. And the commonest and greatest pleasures are, as we have often said, those connected with the body, are they not? Certainly. Are they greater then, and do they become greater in those who are ill, or in those who are in health? Let us take care not to enter hastily and fall into error. Perhaps we might say they are greater in those who are in health. That is reasonable. But are not those pleasures the greatest which gratify the greatest desires? That's true. But do not people who are in a fever or in similar diseases feel more intensely thirst and cold and other bodily sufferings which they usually have? And do they not feel greater want followed by greater pleasure? when their one is satisfied? Is this true or not? Well, now that you've said it, it certainly appears to be true. Then should we appear to be right in saying that if we wish to discover the greatest pleasures, we should have to look not at health, but at disease? Hmm. Now, do not imagine that I mean to ask you whether those who are very ill have more pleasures than those who are well, but assume that I am asking about the greatness of pleasures and where the greatest intensity of such feeling normally occurs. For we say that it is our task to discover the nature of pleasure and what those who deny its existence altogether say that it is. I think I understand you. Presently, Protarchus, you will show that more clearly, for I want you to answer a question. Do you see greater pleasures, I do not mean greater in number, but greater in intensity and degree, in riotous living? or in a life of self-restraint? 
be careful about your body. Now, I understand you, and I see that there is a great difference. For the self-restrained are always held in check by the advice of the proverbial expression, nothing too much, which guides their actions. But intense pleasure holds sway over the foolish and dissolute, even to the point of madness that makes them notorious. Good. And if that is true, it is clear that the greatest pleasures and the greatest pains originate in some depravity of soul and body, not in virtue. Certainly. Then we must select some of the, these pleasures and see what there is about them, which made us say that they are the greatest. Yes, we must. Now see what there is about the pleasures which are related to certain diseases. What diseases? Repulsive diseases, which are the philosophers of dislike. Which the oh, sorry. Repulsive diseases, <coughs> which the philosophers of dis which the philosophers of dislike. Okay. Repulsive diseases which the philosophers of dislike, whom we mention, utterly abominate. Well, what are the pleasures? For instance, the relief of the itch, and the like by scratching, no other treatment being required. For in heaven's name, what shall we say the feeling is which we have in this case? Is it pleasure or pain? Oh, I think, Socrates, it's a mixed evil. I did not introduce this question on Carlevis' account, but unless we consider these pleasures and those that follow in their train, Protarchus, we can probably never settle the point of issue. Then we must attack this family of pleasures. You mean those which are mixed? Certainly. Some mixtures are concerned with the body and are in the body only, and some belong only to the soul and are in the soul. And we shall also find some mingled pains and pleasures belonging both to the soul and to the body. And these are sometimes called pleasures, sometimes pains. How so? Whenever, in the process of restoration or destruction, Anyone has two opposite feelings, as we sometimes are cold, but are growing warm, or are hot, but are growing cold. The desire of having the one and being free from the other, the mixture of the mixture of bitter and sweet, as they say, joined with the difficulty of getting rid of the bitter, produces impatience and later wild excitement. Boy, what you say is perfectly true. And such mixtures sometimes consist of equal pains and pleasures, and sometimes contain more one or the other, do they not? Of course. In the case of the mixtures in which the pains are more than the pleasures, say the itch, which we mentioned just now, or tickling, when the burning inflammation is within and is not reached by the rubbing and scratching, which separate only such mixtures as are on the surface, sometimes by bringing the affected parts to the fire or to something cold, we change from wretchedness to inexpressible pleasures. And sometimes the opposition between the internal and the external produces a mixture of pain and pleasures, whatever, whichever happens to preponderate. This is the result of a forcible separation of combined elements, or the combination of those that were separate, and the concomitant juxtaposition of pain and pleasure. Oh, very true. And when the pleasure is the predominant element in the mixture, a slight tincture of pain tickles a man and makes him mildly impatient, <coughs> or indeed an excessive portion of pleasure, excites him and sometimes even makes him leap for joy. It produces in him all sorts of colors, attitudes, and pantings, and even causes great amazement and foolish shouting, does it not? It certainly does. And it makes him say of himself, and others say of him, that he is pleased to death with these delights. And the more unrestrained and foolish he is, the more he always gives himself up to the pursuit of these pleasures. He calls them the greatest of all things, and counts that man counts that man the great the happiest who lives most entirely in the enjoyment of it. Mm -hmm. Socrates, you have described admirably what happens in the case of most people. That may be, Protarchus, as far as concerns purely bodily pleasures in which the internal and external sensations unite. But concerning the pleasures in which the soul and the body contribute opposite elements, each adding pain or pleasure to the other's pleasure or pain, so that both unite in a single mixture. Concerning these, I said before that when a man is empty, he desires to be filled, and rejoices in his expectation, but is pained by his emptiness. And now I add what I did not say at that time, that in all these cases, which are innumerable, 
of opposition between soul and body, there is one single mixture of pain and pleasure. I believe you are quite right. One further mixture of pain and pleasure is left. What is it? The, that mixture of its own feelings, which we said the soul often experiences. What do we call this? Do you not regard anger, fear, yearning, mourning, love, jealousy, envy, and the like as pains of the soul and the soul no, only? I do. And shall we not find them full of ineffable pleasures? Or must I remind you of the anger which stirs a man, though very wise, to wrath? And sweeter is than the honey from the comb. And of the pleasures mixed with pains, which we find in mournings and longings. No, you need not remind me. Those things occur just as you suggest. And you remember, too, how people enjoy weeping at tragedies. Oh, yes, certainly. And are you aware of the condition of the soul with comedies? How there also we have a mixture of pain and pleasure. Mm, I do not quite understand. Indeed, it is by no means easy for Tarkas to understand such a condition under these circumstances, under those circumstances. No, at least I do not find it so. Okay, let's hold it there. Okay, look. <clears throat> That's a takeoff. Um, let's do this, okay? We're dealing, we want to deal with two classes, and I'd like to sketch it out next week. Look, her. the unmixed class, which starts at 51 on, and the mixed class, in which, which we're in. Okay, let's lay it out and see what he's doing, because we're getting close to that important section that follows from 58 on. Right. So, let's agree. Look over both. Let's sketch them on the board. All of the elements of the mixed class and the unmixed class, but let me ask you something, okay? What does this do if he's really described the issue of pleasure and pain? What does that do to your perception of pleasure? Has he captured it? Hmm. Definitely captured some of it. There's some that's left out. Hmm. What's that? Or let me put it this way, okay? Which as far as we have gone into the mixed class, does that change your view of the kinds of pleasures that you have experienced in the mixed class now that you see the way he analyzes it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What does it do? Well, it, it, um, it keeps me from regarding them as pleasures and as a good. You know, I can't see them that way anymore. It does something to it. Does it? Does it? Yes or no? Yes. What does it do to it? Does it deflate it? What does it do? Causes doubt. Causes doubt. Causes doubt about your own experience it. of pleasure. Right. Hey, this is pleasure. rather strange, isn't it? Yes. I mean, aren't we confident that experience is enough? We thought so. But now he's reflecting on the principles behind it, and you're going, could I have been wrong about this? Doubt? It also, it also raises the question if some pleasures are really good. No, yeah, he still has that. Mm -hmm. And he made that point that some pleasures are good. But we haven't found it yet. And some aren't. Well, let's hope there's a couple left over. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're going to be in a sad shape. Oh, no. well, he, he still hasn't dealt with, with evil pleasures. He says, we'll get to that later. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to deal with that now. Yeah, oh, yeah, goodbye. Because none of this is evil pleasures. Yeah, he's got to deal with it. Mm -hmm. See, the question is, is there any room for it when he gets to the end? Hmm. And therefore, he didn't have to deal with it earlier. Hmm. That's clever if he does that. Hmm. Yes, that is clever. Yeah. So. Doesn't it seem like it makes ridiculous or absurd? Like when he takes the example of the sick person, you know, who, who experiences great thirst and therefore gets great pleasure, you start thinking, well... The way to study pleasures, there's two possibilities. Either take, look, at, here's his principle, right? The greatest pleasures are satisfy the greatest desire. 
If you accept this, is it true that the greatest pleasures satisfy the greatest desires? If so, who would have the greatest desires? Those people in health? Are those people in disease? In disease, see, that's the thing. There's something the wrong. The people that have disease will Absolutely. have the strongest desire to get cured or to feel better. Right. Therefore, that's he's going to build his whole view on the idea of pleasure based person. upon what class of people? Disease pain. people. Yeah. Those that are pain and suffering. <laughs> Why? Because it fits this principle. And then when he points out that you feel pleasure and great anger. Yeah, and how about those wonderful, great examples? Itching. Yes. <laughs> and Achilles' anger right there. Yes. <laughs> he takes the most ludicrous examples, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> to make a philosophical point. Mm -hmm. But if behind that there's a whole bunch of our hopes for pleasure, mm -hmm. by analysis it's shaking some of them, isn't it? Yep. Right. Or putting a severe doubt. It wouldn't be goals then, right? We can't pursue pleasure as a goal in that way because we would have to first desire its opposite. If you're following this then, whatever your particular pleasure is, you'd be looking, let's see, what class does it fall on? Oh, 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 yeah, oh. <laughs> so I would like to just go quick, right? If we take this as an assignment, Right, let's do both. Let's put it all on the board, get it all ready, so then we can proceed into the latter part of the work. All right, rather than just read. Okay. Um, he makes the distinction between the body's pleasure and the soul's. Right. Okay. If the body has pleasure, that implies that there is an intelligence operating that can make such, you know, a distinction. Watch. In, in the yes. Body, in the body. No, the but no, not in the body. Well, it's of the body. Well, then you better say that over again. In the text, he talks about the body having pleasure and pain that is separate from the pleasure and pain of the soul. So, who is the perceptor of the body's pain to give it to the soul? Is it the body itself as a separate intelligible structure? No, no, no. Would you agree, he argues, that this, well, it's right here, the soul has desires, the opposite of the body means then that the body doesn't experience the opposite condition of the body. It only experiences the present experience of the body. Example, if the body has feelings of being empty, thirst, <clears throat> he's saying the body doesn't, at that moment, have any way of being other than being empty. But the sensation of being empty has to be transmitted from something to somewhere. That's true, and that's to the soul. Okay, that part I understand. Yeah. But what is transmitting that idea to the soul? Does that imply that the body what cells? Is that? Wait a minute, what is that yeah, idea? Yeah. Memory. You're saying that the cells have memory? The physical cells have memory? No, okay. we, we may not be together. Yeah. I thought the condition was if the body feels itself being empty, where does it get the notion of pursuing water or some kind of liquid to satisfy its thirst? Well, that part is not a mystery. Well, 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 is mystery. that right? Yeah, that? Yeah, yes, okay. Okay. yes. And your question then is, given what, that condition... Right. What transmits that idea? What intelligible you know, structure transmits okay. that idea? Okay. Okay. Let's see if I understand. You're saying, what experience is being empty? Mm -hmm. It can't be the soul, because the soul is receiving that idea. Well. And remembering what, you know, it did before. No, okay, okay. See if you can follow one word. This word, feelings. Yes. 
the body has feelings. That must mean okay. right? it must be aware of something. It's a feeling. The body feels empty. There's okay. something in the, in the body that recognizes emptiness. But since it feels it. But is the body simply the extension of the soul's memory and experience, or is it separate? Well, see the way you put it. It's separate. Okay. <clears throat> to just separate. If it's separate, it has to have a mechanism to send that information to the soul. No, there isn't any. If you're staying on this level, they are separate and distinct. To satisfy that emptiness, there has to have been some experience of it, of being full. That's memory. Some experience is now in memory. If you didn't have that, you could never satisfy the emptiness. I have no problem with that part of it. My problem still is what? is sending that sensation, that feeling of emptiness. Is it the soul's using the body as a